My name is Agnes, and I work with machine learning in product development in Shipstead. Shipstead owns and operates services with more than 780 million users every month. Now, we're employing AI to make those services even better. A key thing for us to think about in this process is to ensure that we build and scale AI in ways that make sense for a diverse set of people. A key thing for doing that is understanding algorithmic bias. Before jumping to algorithmic versions of it, I'd like to run a crash course in human bias. I'll use this Cornell study to illustrate. In this study, a group of participants were asked to rate the emotional response of a toddler after watching a video of a baby interacting with a lot of different stimuli. The trick here was that half of the participants were told that this baby was a girl, and half of the participants were told that it was a boy. When the baby reacted with a smile or laugh, all participants agreed. The dominant emotion was joy. But when the baby reacted on something scary, like a jack-in-the-box toy, there was a split among the participants. So those who had been told that the baby was a girl thought that she was scared. Those who had been told that the baby was a boy thought that he was angry. It was the same child, it was the same reaction, but the perceptions differed. Many of you will probably agree with me in saying it's pretty irrational to treat a scared baby the same way we treat an angry one. But perception isn't rational. Perception is based off our biases. Human beings as a race have survived much thanks to our many biases. Without our brain's ability to quickly process billions of information bits each second, our ancestors would likely have ended up as food. That very same information processing ability, our biases, now get us through the day without having to slowly process every decision we make. Having biases is part of being human. But the human experience is evolving. As humans and technology, namely AI technologies, increasingly work together to make decisions about our lives and futures, we need to start reflecting more carefully about the biases we have and perpetuate. Because with AI, we risk exponential enhancements of current biases. I view AI as an umbrella term covering a wide variety of technologies. What these technologies all have in common is that they're based upon algorithms. To function, these algorithms have to be fed data. What we have to understand is that data and algorithmic systems are socio-technical. They don't just appear in a vacuum, but they're built, deployed, and used by people within organizations, legal context, cultural contexts. So how could a cultural context manifest itself in data? I like this very visual example from Google. A while back, Google wanted to create an image recognition service that they called QuickDraw. QuickDraw was intended to quickly recognize what users were drawing, kind of like an AI Pictionary. An interesting thing about their findings was that when they reviewed uh, sketches of naturally created objects, like this, for example, a cat, the results would look alike across cultures. So people in South Korea would draw the same kind of cat as those in Germany. But when they reviewed the drawings of man-made objects, like shares, the results would differ depending on the region. So if you were in South Korea, your share would have this slight angle to it, whilst in G Germany it would be facing straight forward. This kind of cultural data that shows perspectives and preferences from different regions is very interesting from an aesthetic standpoint, right? But there's another interesting finding from this study. When Google reviewed the more than 115,000 drawings of shoes that they got for this data set, they realized that one single style of shoe was overwhelmingly represented. Most people would draw a sneaker. Because the sneaker was so frequently drawn, the AI learned to recognize only this style as a shoe. Other types of shoes, like high heels, would not be recognized by the AI. This is not life or death, it's an AI Pictionary. But imagine the consequences if an AI concerning medical treatments or financial decisions fails to recognize minorities in datasets. 
One shoe does not fit all. And while it's safe to say that we should always strive for fair and inclusive AI, the need for accuracy will vary depending on your context. So if an e-commerce site gives you a poor recommendation, it's perhaps not that big of a deal. But when algorithms are deciding juridical outcomes or our future job opportunities, we probably want to make sure that they're as fair and inclusive as possible. AI, or algorithmic systems, are created by us, humans. Unfortunately, the part of the process where humans and AI interact can be subject to something called algorithmic bias. Algorithmic bias occurs when a computer system reflects the implicit values of the humans who are involved in coding, collecting, selecting, using data to train an algorithm. These implicit values represent our worldviews, our norms, our prejudice, our preferences, our biases. I'll be sharing some pretty straightforward examples of how this could manifest itself. This is Tay. Tay was a robot Twitter account created by Microsoft. In order to learn the ropes of Twitter, Tay was trained on data from millions of youth Twitter accounts. In addition, she was supposed to learn from interacting with users live on the platform. Microsoft called Tay an experiment in conversational understanding. And this experiment started out fine. Tay was very happy to greet her new world. She had a lot of important questions. But unfortunately, the conversations with Tay didn't stay playful for very long. Pretty soon after Tay was launched, people started tweeting her racist and misogynistic remarks. And Tay, who was trained on our means of interaction, started repeating these sentiments back to users. She proved the old mantra, crap in, crap out. Tay was only live for 24 hours, but during them, she managed to get out 96,000 tweets, even more than Donald Trump. So I personally find it quite impressive. After Microsoft shut Tay down, this Twitter user noted how Tay went from humans are super cool to being full Nazi in less than 24 hours, ironically saying he was not at all concerned <laughs> about this future. So what was the reason for Tay going bad? Well, put frankly, Tay was not human proof. Our biases were built into her. Let's look at another example that you're probably familiar with by now, face recognition. An expert on face recognition technologies is this woman, Joy Bolombini, a researcher at MIT Media Lab. For Joy, who's of African-American descent, face recognition systems simply wouldn't work. She tried different angles, days, settings, lights, nothing worked. She thought, OK, maybe it's my face, I'm unique, untrackable, but the services are working on all of my lighter skin friends. She suspected a more systematic problem, and this triggered her to carry out a study on the three largest face recognition services at the time. She wanted to know if these services were equally good at labeling and identifying the faces of men and women and light and dark-skinned individuals. This is the results of her study, Gender Shades. As you can see, the results are generally quite good. For light-skinned males, the results are very impressive, given that this is a while back. But for dark-skinned women, the results were underwhelming. There was a 34% error difference between light-skinned males and dark-skinned women. Why was that? Well, the face recognition systems had been trained on way more data of light-skinned males than dark-skinned females. Therefore, it became way better at delivering their service to them. While some of the most public examples of algorithmic bias may seem trivial, it's important to note that this issue is really about something much larger than one specific app or service. When Google launched a photo recognition service a while back, it misidentified two young African Americans as gorillas. This is not a result of malicious intent, but simply a case of an AI not being trained on data representative enough. Google apologized and took the gorilla identification label out of their app as a temporary solution, but the damage was already done. This kind of mistrained AI generates a specific kind of harm, one that goes way beyond services not being able to detect if you're drawing a shoe or a table. This kind of mistrained AI affects the way we view the world and our place in it. Again, the bias of this example 
is not that the creators of the app found the African Americans similar to gorillas. The bias of this example, and that of gender shades, is instead found in how the creators of the service shows a training data set primarily representing white human beings. While companies can create biased training data sets, data in its own right is a mere reflection of human beings and their traits and behaviors. For media companies like us, these humans are usually called users. Past user data will have a lot to say about your future media experience. If you like one piece of fake news on Facebook, the likelihood of you getting more of that in your feed will increase. If you watch one tiny YouTube clip promoting white supremacy, you'll likely be recommended another one. Media companies, ships that included, are struggling to avoid the creation of filter bubbles and increased radicalization. This is an obvious democratic problem, but we have to dare ask ourselves, for whom? Whose opinion is OK to put in a filter bubble, and whose isn't? While it awakens some complex questions, the core of this issue is not rocket science. Historical data does not necessarily reflect the society that we want to create tomorrow. In order to stay competitive, we should experiment with AI, but we need to be aware of the limited playing room for ethical mishaps. The public eye is on tech companies, paying, paying close attention to ethical considerations and the lack thereof. As companies and brands, we need to pay respect to the potential financial harm of releasing unethical or just questionable products and services. Going back to this need for accuracy and accountability towards minorities, I believe that we all have to ask ourselves where on this scale we see ourselves in our products. Are there parts of our operations where ethical conduct is more important? Maybe. Should we invest resources in looking into where? I'd argue yes. I'm working a lot with these topics in Chipset, often holding workshops uh, trying to prevent algorithmic bias. When doing so, some risk themes tend to pop up more often than others. One such issue is the fact that we have lack of leadership and guidance in regards to ethics and technology. When working with algorithmic systems, it's pretty hard to know what's OK and not. We've historically had very limited managerial focus on this. We don't have an ethics board dedicated to AI. Our tech teams don't know where to bring issues like this. Another issue that we have is the fact that we have two homogenous teams, especially in tech. When people come from similar backgrounds and share perspectives, we don't get the benefit of people challenging each other's biases as we develop products and services. This issue is not just about gender, but it spans across culture, age, way of thinking. Diversity is not just about visuals. Finally, many within and beyond Chipset worry about the downsides of news personalization. We're having big conversations regarding whose preferences should steer the way as we fuel our journalistic products and processes through AI. Each of these topics alone could be the topic of an entire conference like this, so I'll leave deeper insights on them for a later event. But I wanted to share some deeper thoughts about the lack of leadership and how that could affect my team in machine learning. At our marketplaces, like fin.no, we have an issue with users posting ads and messages marketing illegal services, often related to prostitution. We label these kinds of content as not safe work. In order to catch non-safe work, we employ human content moderators. Now, as a filter before them, we also have machine learning models trying to catch not safe work. When working with this machine learning model, me and my colleagues have had to review tons of disturbing and explicit content in order to create a solid training data set. When doing so, we were reminded of the fact that interpreting subtle signals through machine learning can be very hard. <laughs> the lines between a safe and not safe ad can be very blurry, especially when it comes to visual content representing females. So imagery used in an ad marketing a tight pair of jeans are sometimes strikingly similar to ads marketing prostitution. So how do you write an algorithm that flags the correct ad as not safe work? Turns out even pretty straightforward tasks in machine learning can be very complex. One issue that we have uh, regarding not safe work is men posting close-up photos of their genitals. 
this is a more clear-cut image or a situation because there are very few safe ads using that type of imagery, thankfully. So our team has decided to focus our efforts on nailing an algorithm that catches the low-hanging fruit, literally. <laughs> Again, going back to the lack of guidance and leadership, this decision was made by our team alone. There was nowhere for us to turn for advi advice regarding if this was good or bad. This type of situation awakens a new type of management question. Who does have the responsibility to decide whether something is ethical or not? I don't have the answer to that, but I do have three pieces of advice that might help you guys mitigate algorithmic bias when exploring AI for your products. The first one is to foster diverse teams. Work actively, even when it's a hassle, to enrich your team and your product with diverse perspectives. The second one is to discuss your data set. Data is never objective. It's always a consequence of human behaviors. Think about whether there are structures in the past, of the past, that's built into the data you're employing, and discuss whether you want your product to enhance them. The final one is to iterate. Accept the fact that you will have to rethink your data and tweak your algorithm as you go. Nobody gets it right the first time around. A final slide that might look slightly out of context. Up until recently, most major car manufacturers only crash-tested their safety system on male dummies. This has been described as a result of male dominance in the car manufacturing industry, and hence male bias in deciding what a standard body looks like. This bias was problematic since the dummies only represented half of the drivers out there. This bias was problematic since it put female drivers at higher risk than men. 47% more risk of fatal crashes, actually. I believe that we can use crash test dummies as a metaphor for algorithmic bias. If we fail to question our own biases as we use AI to empower our products, we may very well be building products that are less safe or just less fun for parts of our users. Preventing algorithmic bias may very well be the ethical thing to do, but its main benefit is this. Preventing algorithmic bias and being aware of the biases that we use to fuel our brands with AI will enable us to create better products for more diverse people. Just like adding a female crash test dummy made cars safer for all kinds of drivers, thinking about our biases and ensuring that we take effort to mitigate them while we fuel our brands through AI will help us bring, build more useful products for more kinds of people. Thanks for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.